bit about first about my history, where I've been, um, where I've trained, what I've done. I'm not just out of training. I've been practicing a few years before I came to CGH. Came back to Illinois because I had trained in Chicago several years ago. I had done my residency here. Went off to the military. I'll talk to you a bit about that, what I've done in the military. And then we'll talk about kind of some general cardiology, what we typically provide here, the things that we do here. And then an overview of kind of the future of cardiology and what we can either do here, or what we're going to do here, or um, things that we can refer you to, some of the uh, more Thank you. Some of the more unusual things that are available to us in this area that we may not specifically do here um, for one reason or another, but we can refer you to for um, treatment of kind of the more complex or unusual things. OK, my background, I'm board certified in several different uh, specialties. My main is interventional cardiology by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Also, general cardiology, which is cardiovascular medicine and internal medicine. I keep up to date in internal medicine. I think that's important to do. I've recertified once in that already, which means I've been basically an internist for 12 years before doing cardiology. I'm also board certified in nuclear cardiology and National Board of Echocardiography. Basically, my time in the military allowed me to kind of pause in my training sequence to allow me to acquire additional skills that um, some cardiologists for whatever reason, um, usually because of time commitments, aren't allowed to do or don't have the time to do. I'm a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and of uh, the Society of uh, Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions, which is basically um, the society that basically deals with cardiac interventions in the cath lab. My military service was for 11 years as a lieutenant commander. I'm currently a commander in the US Navy Reserve. I was an assistant professor of medicine at Uniform Services University of Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland, teaching residents um, and interns, medical students, doing that. Um, I started in, in 1994 at Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine right at the end of 88 in Downers Grove. Did my residency in internal medicine at Lutheran General in Park Ridge from 98 to 2001. Very big hospital, very busy place where I learned to be a physician. Uh, did my fellowship at uh, National Naval Medical Center, Walter Reed Army Medical Center, and then finished up at uh, Duke University where I did cardiac interventions for two years. So that's my history. You know a little bit more about what, I, what I've been, what I've done, what I can do. So I thought I'd get into um, some ge just general things about when maybe you should think about seeing a cardiologist. If you have any questions along the way, please stop me, and I'd be more than happy to um, entertain any questions as we go along. Um, so the first thing is obviously exertional chest pain and pressure. I get lots of consults uh, for that complaint. And sometimes it's serious, and oftentimes it isn't. Um, but it, it's really helpful for a cardiologist to determine, after asking you a series of questions, whether your chest pain could be something concerning or not. If you have a history of cardiac disease and have had stents or coronary artery bypass grafting in the past. Recurrent chest discomfort is another important thing. Are you having this and what might be the reasons for it? Some of them are cardiac, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's something very simple. Another important thing is palpitations. I see a lot of people every day for palpitations. Some palpitations are important. Others are just kind of benign or not serious, uh, but again, it's um, something that you should consider seeing a cardiologist for, and sometimes I would order, or any other cardiologist in the clinic would order a halter monitor or some monitoring to determine um, what the cause of your palpitations may be. Palpitations is a sense of fluttering of your heart. Shortness of breath is a big one. There are a lot of things that can cause shortness of breath. Sometimes they're cardiac, sometimes they're long, sometimes they're something else. If you have shortness of breath and that's your main complaint, there are a series of different types of testing that we will order to figure out what the cause of your shortness of breath is. Um, unexplained leg swelling, similar reasons. Episodes of nearly passing out. If you passed out before, probably you should see a cardiologist. Um, and then burning in your legs and calves when you walk. Um, that's an often a complaint that is overlooked, but can indicate that there's a problem with your cardiovascular system, perhaps blockages in the arteries that supply blood to your legs. 
There are a lot of things that can be done, and I'll talk about that um, to address those types of symptoms. Any questions at this point? So I, I wanted to include this. Is, these these first few slides are some just some kind of some general tenets of the practice of cardiology and things that I like to educate the patient um, on. When, when somebody ends up having heart disease, incorporating that person into their own care is very important and helping them understand their disease process and what they can do to dramatically modify how that disease will behave over time. That's critically important. People who are invested in their own care and the more they learn about it, the more they know about it, the, the, the likelihood that they're going to do much better over time is much higher. So some things uh, that are things that some things that we can control, some things we can't. Probably the most important one is age. That's not obviously something that can be changed. So we just have to deal with that risk factor um, as the person uh, gets older. Diabetes mellitus is another big one. Controlling your diabetes is very important for the prevention of future cardiovascular events. Um, you'll see some of the, the topics or themes about cardiology care is really the prevention. I'm a big believer in preventing things before they happen. And you do that you know, by modifying or controlling these things. And when nothing happens, I consider that success. Um, but then when something does happen, we're prepared to deal with it. Um, advanced chronic um, kidney disease um, is another big problem. The asterisks that I have by diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and peripheral vascular disease are what are considered cardiovascular equivalent diagnoses. So if you have these problems, it's as though you have coronary artery disease already. From a physician's perspective or a cardiologist's perspective, if you've never had a heart attack, if you've never had your arteries looked at before, but you have one of these conditions, our thought process is that you already have blockages there. We just don't know whether they're of concern or not. Um, high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol are things that we can control. We can modify these risks. The next slide will talk a bit about modification. I'm kind of throwing that in, the, on in this slide. Uh, family history of premature. Um, coronary disease and first three relatives. So that is your mom, dad, brothers and sister, or maybe even your children. It doesn't really matter if it's your, um, your aunt that has coronary disease or even your grandparent. It's what your parents are, your first three relatives that make the difference. You, that's something you really can't change. So age, family history are things that we just have to, to accept and deal with. Uh, but a lot of the cardiac risk are things that you can change and modify and improve your chances of a better um, long-term uh, benefit. Cigarette smoking is a big one. Whenever I see folks who are relatively young, like in their early 50s, 40s, sometimes in their 30s, if they come in with a heart attack, there's a good chance that they're, they're a smoker. Um, being overweight, it's a, kind of a, a mild risk factor, not nearly as significant as the others, but um, it, it does confer some risk. And then uh, untreated obstructive sleep apnea. So folks and some of you in, in here may have sleep apnea or not, you, you know how challenging it is to wear that mask at night. Um, but if you can tolerate it and get used to it, the majority of folks that I've talked to don't want to eventually live without that mask at night because they end up feeling so much better during the day. Um, but left untreated, that really places a demand on your cardiovascular system. It can increase your pressures in your heart. It can affect the conduction system of your heart. It's, it's a real problem, and it's very common. So many people have this, and a lot of them don't know it. It's usually the spouse that will only admit on questioning by the doctor, does your spouse ever stop breathing in the night, start snorting and stop breathing and then breathe and gasp for air? The person usually doesn't, the, the person that has this isn't usually aware of it. It's the, the spouse that usually says, yeah, you know, they do this all the time, all night, and they've been doing it for years. So this next slide, I kind of touched a little bit on, on the last slide. Risk factor modification, I put it in red because it's so important. When you have a routine visit in the cardiologist's office, this is the thing that we're thinking of when we, when we talk to you. We're looking at what are the conditions that you have 
what can we do, what's not under good control that we can change, either through <coughs> lifestyle uh, changes, dietary changes, exercise changes, weight reduction, smoking cessation, things like that. What, what can we do that will really decrease this person's risk of a future heart event? Um, and then some of the things that we look at, why are we always checking a cholesterol panel on you? Because of what the target goals are. LDL cholesterol, your bad cholesterol, it's the LDL. HDL cholesterol, it's interesting to know what that is. We don't really have great medications right now to, de to increase your good cholesterol level and have it may have a meaningful impact. Right now, studies have been done with new agents specifically to increase the HDL, but none of those have been shown to have any impact yet. They're not ready for prime time, and a few studies have shown worse outcomes for one reason or another. But that's something to stay tuned to. Eventually, we'll have medications that will raise the HDL, and at the same time, will have a dramatic impact on uh, somebody's long-term outcome in terms of reduction of cardiovascular disease. Blood pressure, there are goals that should be attained, less than 140 over 90. Be below an A1C, which is a long-term three-month check of your blood sugar, should be less than seven. These are all kind of guideline, national guideline base indicators of what, where somebody should be. Compliance with medical therapy, that's big. Unfortunately, I see some folks, fortunately the minority, that they don't care, they just don't wanna comply with the treatment regimen. Um, you know, for various reasons. And, and those, per, those people that feel like that always make me a little bit nervous because they tend not to do as well over time. Stop smoking, wear your CPAP for sleep apnea, weight reduction, and increase physical activity. This is one that probably a lot of, a lot of physicians address increase physical activity, but for somebody with heart disease and angina, that is pain from the heart, that's very important to know. For example, let's say that you had a bypass a year ago and you exercise doing a mile light jog every day and you have no symptoms when you do that. That's a great indicator that you're in good shape. Um, so knowing where your chest pain threshold is, is very important uh, for me to predict how you're doing. If you're sedentary and you don't do anything, and you've been bypassed, let's say, a year ago, or you received a stent a year ago, you don't really exert yourself at all. There's a question, you know, as to, what well, does this person have angina? And they just don't know it because they don't do anything. The reason that that's important is that, well, let's say you're going to go for a knee replacement, um, and you have an anginal threshold that's pretty low. That tells me that you're at risk for having an event when you have your surgery. So a lot of times I'll get a referral from the surgeons for me to assess somebody's operative risk prior to their knee surgery or hip or whatever the case may be. And if you're unable to exercise or do anything for whatever reason, sometimes because of the orthopedic problem, I'll do a stress test on you to see if I can uncover some risk that's not apparent because the person's just not doing a whole lot. And then we can address that based on the results of the test. So typical medical therapy would be uh, aspirins, statins, like uh, Crestor, Lipitor, Simvastatin, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, or, which are a blood pressure medication, but they're very good at doing, not doing, they're very good at doing more than just treating blood pressure. And statins are very good at doing more than just reducing the cholesterol numbers. They actually stabilize the plaque um, that are already there. Some high potency statins can actually reduce some of the plaque volume. That's kind of the, the, uh, the goal long term of medical therapy will be medications that can be given that can reduce the plaque burden that's already there. That's going to be exciting. That's the future. It's not going to be next year, but the future, and it'll be very interesting to see how that all works, works out. Calcium channel blockers are good for not only for blood pressure control, but they're good for uh, reduction in angina. So if you are somebody that has angina, sometimes a certain level of angina is acceptable if it's stable, it's chronic, it doesn't change over time. Uh, if you're seeing me, I'll have you on a certain combination of medicines that can keep the, the angina stable. 
And then over time, if that angina changes or gets more frequent or prevalent or less activity can, uh, uh, causes it to occur, then that tells me there's been a change or a progression uh, likely in, in, your, in your heart disease. Diuretics, especially if you have congestive heart failure, whether it's the type of congestive heart failure from a stiff heart or from a heart that doesn't squeeze well, very often prescribed. Something called aldosterone antagonist diuretics like spironolactone and plerinone are not only good as a diuretic, but they, they prevent or reduce fibrosis that occurs within the heart and heart failure. And the fibrosis is basically what causes scarring of that squeezing chamber of the heart to occur. So when you prevent that, that's obviously a good thing. And that's why these medications have been shown to prolong survival. So very important medication, often overlooked. So medications that have been shown to improve survival in heart disease patients are aspirin, statins, um, aldosterone antagonists, sometimes antiarrhythmics, depending on what the indication is. So there's always a reason, you know, sometimes you come to the cardiologist and suddenly you get a whole bunch of medications. There are specific reasons why we're giving you each one. We hope, we hope that you can tolerate them without having some sort of side effect from them. And because of the reasons that I'm briefly touching on today. Anticoagulants, if you have atrial fibrillation, there's a risk for stroke. The um, atrial fibrillation is kind of a quivering that occurs on the top two chambers of the heart, which are called the atria. So you have four chambers of the heart, you have the atria, you have the ventricles. When you have atrial fibrillation, there isn't uniform contraction of the atria. So usually there's a contraction of the atria followed by the ventricles. In a normal situation, you get bump, dump type of heartbeat. Well, when you're in atrial fibrillation, the top chamber just kind of quivers and it doesn't contract. What does that lead to? That leads to blood stagnating along the wall of that atria. And that can cause, that's why there's a risk for stroke with that. So depending on your risk factors, which I won't specifically go into tonight, sometimes cardiologists will often recommend that you have your blood fed because of atrial fibrillation. It used to be only Coumadin or Warfarin uh, was available, rat poison. Uh, but we have better options now. Unfortunately, they're pretty expensive because they're all so new. Uh, but um, the staff in our clinic are good at trying to do whatever we can to, to make sure that you can be on those medications if we think it's a good choice for you. The newer ones, the oral ones, the fourth one was just approved, I think, on Monday. Um, it's kind of a Me Too medication. No one is better than another. None of them have been compared head to head. They've all been compared to the old Coumadin, Warfarin, and they're all better than that. They're all, they all have less bleeding risk than Warfarin or Coumadin, and they're better at stroke prevention. But each one of them, in between them, are, are not, it's unknown whether one is better than another. Um, but they're very important medications, and you don't need to have your blood checked once a month. You don't have to worry about green leafy vegetable intake or changing your diet by taking them. Most of them are dosed based on your kidney function, so that makes them a really good choice, and they work very quick, which is nice. Any questions about that? <laughs> okay, so a little bit about, uh, I'm going to talk about coronary blockages, something that we typically do, which is a big part of our practice here in addition to blood pressure control and cholesterol control. AFib, what I just talked about. I'll talk about coronary blockages. These are the things that if somebody's having a heart attack in the middle of the night, we come in and we open them up. Our cath lab here is a 24-7 cath lab, so if it's 3 in the morning and you have some sort of event, we're going to take care of you. We have a second cath lab that's opening. Um, we're very excited about that. Um, two weeks from now, or a little less than two weeks, we have an open house next Tuesday from 3 to 6 o'clock. I would encourage you guys to come to that if you're interested. To see our new lab, come take a look and um, we can show you kind of what the, the things that we use and the, the uh, facility that's available to us. We're very excited about that. So in the, uh, in the treatment of coronary blockages, the, the typical treatment has been angioplasty and stent placement. Um, that's been around since mid, mid to late 70s. Stents have been around since 
mid-90s, mid to late 90s, bare metal stent, drug-coated stents first came along about 2000, or 1999 maybe, 19, yeah, 1999, 2000. Um, drug-coated stents, I'll talk about them in a minute, are very important. Coronary artery bypass grafting, sometimes if you have a recommendation for heart catheterization and we tell you you'd be better served by having a heart bypass, it's because you have a lot of blockages or blockages in dangerous places and we think it would be better for you to, to have a bypass surgery. We don't make that decision lightly. When we look and we see, you know, we understand what's involved with that, opening the person's chest, the recovery time that's involved from that. It's a major interruption in their life, but when we make that recommendation, we, recommendation, we don't do so lightly because of all that's involved in that. But we really believe that it would be better served by that. This is an interesting one, and it's kind of a relatively new concept. Not all blockages need to be treated. If it's a small vessel, or the person's not symptomatic from the blockage, or the body is kind of auto-bypassed itself past the blockage, stress test wasn't positive in that area. We do a stress test in the lab by the IFR, FFR, intravascular ultrasound. We do that in the lab. And if it shows that that plaque either isn't significant, even though it might look so on the angiogram, if we do a stress test in the lab or we've had a nuclear study that said that it wasn't significant, they don't need to be treated. And in fact, if you do treat it, you have to have good reasons for doing that. Otherwise, you're falling outside what's considered appropriate care. And there are criteria now that are becoming um, guidelines, not only guidelines, but recommendations for what you should do and not do in treatment of blockages. Some cardiologists have gotten into hot water because they have what's called the oculus stenotic reflex. They see, their eye sees a blockage, they treat it. That's not the right thing to do anymore. And, and labs that do that, or doctors that do that, have been penalized, and some have had their licenses taken away for that reason. Back, I, I came from Maryland, and there was a doctor there that uh, had his license taken away from two year, for two years. He's in Saudi Arabia right now. So this is real, this is real stuff. In Texas, there was a fellow, same thing. And there, as I mentioned, there are ways of determining. If we see a plaque in the cath lab, we may not always stent it. And we may show you after the case. There's a blockage here, but it doesn't need to be treated. And we'll explain the reasons why. That's not the majority, though. The majority do need to be treated, because it's usually the reason that you got to the, the heart lab in the first place. Any questions on that? Yes? My brother just had open heart surgery done. <coughs> Someone told him that the new thing now that's coming is that they're not going to have to break the chest bone anymore. Is that correct? There are minimally invasive um, procedures where you know, they can do, not, instead of an open thoracotomy, a laparoscopic procedure for a bypass surgery. Um, there are some surgeons that are doing that. It's not the majority right now, but it is possible. It depends on how many grafts they need and the location that's needed, but sometimes, yes, that, that is true. And then going back to the blood thinner thing, uh, they have him on Coonan because they want to keep his blood so thin. Is that the normal routine? If you have Rather any, than to go with Plavix or something like that? Yeah, so Plavix and aspirin are antiplatelet agents, whereas Coumadin is an anti, what's called an antithrombin, which is um, not platelets, the clotting factors within the blood that the liver produces that create a big clot to occur. Whether, it, like, if you cut yourself, the platelets rush in and stop the bleeding initially. And if the cut is deep enough, you'll get these clotting factors that then come in and kind of create a, a big, basically, plug uh, to prevent, prevent you from bleeding. And that can occur within anywhere within the vascular system. So if you have a reason to be on a blood thinner, uh, for like AFib, atrial fibrillation, or recurrent blood clots in the leg or in the lung, um, antiplatelet agents like aspirin and platics aren't enough. Been studied very well, not good enough. So you need either warfarin, coumadin, or one of these new, uh, new oral agents where you don't need to be um, checked every month. He had a, a aneurysm on the aorta also. Yeah. That they had to repair. Yes. 
And then sometimes if you've had a heart attack on the front side of the heart, sometimes it will thin your blood for a period of time because you can develop a blood clot in the main chump pumping chamber of the heart. Um, for a short period of time, there's that risk is there, but then it falls off over time. Any other questions? So I figured I'd break up the monotony, monotony of me talking and just show you a couple films. This is a fellow that I just treated uh, last month who uh, came in with a heart attack. He'd had about two hours of chest discomfort. This is the right coronary artery. So this artery comes down from the right and it wraps around and then goes to the back side of the heart. And this can be a very serious heart attack. It could be life-threatening and oftentimes is and sometimes can cause the need for temporary pacemaker or even for the person to for their blood pressure to completely fall, we have to support them um, by uh, other means, medications and various things in the, in the lab. Fortunately, this fellow it did okay um, without having to get overly aggressive. So you can see the artery kind of flows here and then just kind of stops right about there. So what I do is I put a very fine wire, it's like a, almost like a cat whisker, um, very fine with a really soft tip, and I slowly thread it down the artery, and kind of the uh, shaft of the, of the catheter is, is stiffer, and we're able to put catheters down that, that uh, wire that has a very soft tip, and in the process, usually reestablish flow. So just the artery itself in this situation, reestablish flow down the artery. There's the, there's the clot, that's, that's clot right there that has occurred with a plaque rupture. So what happens is, is you have a plaque that's there, for whatever reason, the plaque has ruptured. And sometimes that rupture doesn't shut down the artery, and sometimes it does. When it shuts down the artery all the way, you usually come in as an, what we call an acute heart attack. Um, lots of chest pain. The EKG is very classic that this person needs to go to the lab right away without delay. Typically in this setting, I think what I did right before this picture is I sucked out a little bit of clot. I have a little catheter that I put down the wire and suck out clot, and then take the next picture, and I've reestablished flow down the artery. Usually at this point, the person's already feeling much better. This is a balloon right here that I put up. So I, this is the angioplasty. Typically what I do is suck out clot, put the wire down, suck out clot, then angioplasty to make sure that the plaque will move out of the way. And then once I'm assured of that, then I'll put a stent in. This right here is the stent before I've deployed the stent. Sorry, it's really fast. So I'll take the final shot before I put the stent up, make sure that the stent is in good position. Now what a stent is, is a stent acts as a metal, metal scaffold that's crimped onto a balloon and it's attached to the catheter. The catheter with the stent gets uh, set down the wire, which is very firm, it can hold the, the stent on the wire, and you push it to the right where the blockage is. Take a picture to make sure you're in the right spot and then you inflate the balloon, and when you inflate the balloon, it causes that stent to expand. And they make stents various different sizes, lengths. So we determine, we can do measurements in the lab, sometimes we can just eyeball it, how big the stent should be, and what pressure should, we should go up to to treat it. These are all things that are technical considerations that you kind of develop and act for over time. This is the stent being deployed, balloon is up, stents being deployed, and then this is the final picture. Stents in place, plaque is gone. So that's pretty much it. He's done and he's done great after that. So when I send him home, I send him home on a various regimen of medications to prevent this from happening again and to, to allow that stent to heal into place. Any questions there? This is my final um, part of my talk. What's new? What's coming down the pipe? What are some of the exciting things that we as doctors have a chance to 
work with and our patients, how can they benefit from the things that are that are being in, that are being developed and now coming on the market. So I mentioned earlier in the talk, high potency statin, resuvastatin is the one statin medication that's been shown to decrease very small but real the volume of the plaque that's developed in the coronary artery. So that's an exciting thing. An antiplatelet agent, which has been around about two years now, which has actually been shown to improve survival, and that's the first one, and that's called Ticagalor. If you come in with a heart attack, there's a good chance that I would treat you with that medicine, and probably the first one, too. Drug-coated stents, um, there is basically, the stent is a very thin metal scaffold, usually made of either platinum chromium or chromium cobalt, they're called metal, but these things are so thin, you know, you could crush them so easily just by pinching them. But when they're in the artery of your heart and they're deployed at high pressure, boy, they make a big difference. The drug-coated stents are, it's not that they're better than the bare metal stents. Um, they each have their pluses and minuses, but in general, these tend to, not tend, they do, over a long period of time, remain more patent than the drug than a non-drug coated stent, the bare metal stent. There are certain situations where we would choose one versus another. But that's, a, that's pretty exciting. Drug coated stents aren't exactly new. They've been around since 19, or 2003 or four, probably three. Is that right, John? Three? Mm -hmm. um, Bioabsorbable stents, very exciting. This is a big hot topic at conferences. And eventually this will be widespread. Wouldn't it be great to be able to put a stent in an artery and that stent then dissolves over time? You treat the plaque, get the plaque out of the way, but you don't have metal sitting in there. Sometimes if somebody needs a lot of stents in, the, in their arteries, if you put a lot of stents in, you prevent or you reduce the chance that they could ever go to bypass again because you can't break into a stent once it's there. The surgeon needs to be able to break in and open up the artery to, get, to attach his bypass graft. With bioabsorbable stents, that won't ever occur again. So that's exciting. Probably two or three years away at this point before those actually come on the market. They're in testing right now and testing for safety as well as efficacy, which is effectiveness. Arthrectomy catheters are, are very, um, very helpful. These can actually break up the plaque that's there, both in the coronary arteries as well as in the arteries of the legs. Um, very important in terms of treating somebody who has very long-standing or calcified, lots of calcium disease in their arteries. Um, drug eluding balloons have just been FDA approved. And those are balloons that go down, they're not a stent, they're just the balloon. And they're coated with drug. And typically those are used in the arteries of the legs. And those can help maintain patency openness of the artery as opposed to just um, a balloon that isn't drug coated. Basically, there's a polymer on the balloon, it's coated with the drug, you deploy the balloon, put the balloon down, the drug remains in the artery along the walls. What's, what's eluding mean? Eluding means coated. Basically, elude means, elude is um, the process of a drug kind of coming off the polymer. Polymer is a, a chemical that the drug is impregnated on. So when it eludes, there's a time for the elution to occur. So elution is drug coming off the polymer. And that's why typically if you get a drug coated stent, you have to be on aspirin and Plavix typically or the antiplatelet agents for longer because there's delayed healing of the vessel around the stent while that elution takes place. So elution is the drug coming off. Thank you. Cardioperfusion support devices are a great thing to have. We're considering adding these types of um, devices to our um, arsenal here that we use to treat folks. For high-risk angioplasty, typically we haven't done high-risk angioplasty here because we don't have a cardiothoracic surgeon yet um, to do the high-risk things. But th these are things that we could potentially add if we wanted to 
consider doing those, or at least in the case of cardiogenic shock, that is somebody who had a heart attack and they cannot, their left ventricle, the squeezing chamber of their heart, cannot support their blood pressure. These devices can make the difference in, between life and death while, you, while we're working to get the arteries in a better condition. Other things that are new in CV medicine, not exactly new, but relatively new, are biventricular pacemakers for heart failure. A lot of people have done very well with upgrading their single chamber pacemaker to a biventricular. Atrial fibrillation ablation, which we don't do here, and actually biventricular pacemakers we don't do here either. But we have folks in the area that are very good at doing both of these things. If you have atrial fibrillation, it is very difficult to treat. Um, having an atrial fibrillation ablation may be something that may be a benefit to you. And if I see you as a patient and we get to the point where, well, your atrial fibrillation is really tough here, you know, we're at kind of at the end. We've tried all the medications and you feel terrible. Let's think about sending you for heart, um, an atrial fibrillation ablation. There are doctors in the Quad Cities that could do that, Rockford, University of Wisconsin. Northwestern, typically the places that we send folks. CardioMIMS, implanted device for managing heart failure. We're considering adding this modality here. This is very new, um, FDA approved very recently for the detection of heart failure before you even know it, before you feel the thing. This is a simple device that gets implanted in the pulmonary artery. It takes about 10 minutes to put it in. Very safe. It doesn't have its own battery. It never wears out. There is a device that sits next to your bed that you turn on, which then powers the device and reports electronically a impedance number. And that impedance correlates with how much fluid you're retaining. In heart failure, there's always a problem. They're, they're always the concern is, what's your daily weight? How much are you gaining fluid? Are your legs swelling? Are you getting short of breath? Those are all relatively later findings. This is something that can determine if you're in heart failure or developing heart failure long before those symptoms even occur. So that's something that, that's very exciting, I think, for heart failure management, reduction of heart failure admissions to the hospital, which is one of the main reasons that folks come to the hospital is for heart failure. So that could be a really big changer in improving the quality of life for folks with heart failure. Another hot topic is percutaneous aortic valve replacement. When I was finishing up training, this was just coming online, 2010. Um, and now it's, there's been five years of experience with it. It's become more widespread. They're doing it in Quad Cities now. This is for folks who, either for personal choice or because of um, other high-risk features like bad kidney function, bad lungs, can't tolerate general anesthetic, a valve put in through the leg in a catheter-based procedure can oftentimes in that situation be life-saving for the person. If you are in a valve is very tight and you're having symptoms from it, if you don't have that fixed, your, it's, your outcome is, short-term outcome is very poor. Fixing that with either open aortic valve replacement, open heart surgery, or this percutaneous, that is by catheter base, aortic valve replacement is life saving and will dramatically prolong your life. Coming soon, but not yet um, available, are leadless pacemakers. That'll be exciting just to see how those work. I don't even really know exactly how they'll work at this point, but there's talk about them. Um, I'm a um, you know, there are kind of three branches of cardiology. There's general cardiologists uh, with imaging. I do that. There's kind of the plumber cardiologist that works on the arteries and blood flow. That's me. And then there's the electrical cardiologist that does the ablations and the special devices. Um, those, I think the closest one is in the Quad Cities. Um, that's kind of, that'll be out of their domain. But I would imagine that probably something we could eventually have here before too long. I put down LVAD as destination therapy. What is an LVAD, left ventricular assist device? Dick Cheney had one for several years, it saved his life before he got his transplant. We have folks in the clinic that have these. Most of ours are managed at Northwestern, I believe. Um, so we will periodically follow them and see them in addition to Northwestern seeing them. 
So as destination therapy means that that's it. You're, this is what you're going to have for the rest of your life and manage that or you're a candidate for heart transplant surgery. These are folks for, that have really advanced heart failure. Without this device, they would not live. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. I have a question on the ablation. Yes. The I mean, AFib and the ablation. Now, how successful is that in treating AFib? It's not 100%. It depends. They do what's called pulmonary vein isolation. And I've heard electrophysiologists describe it to me as it's not a cure, but it can dramatically reduce the recurrent the incidence of AFib. So if you have an AFib fib ablation, don't look for it to cure you of AFib. Look for it to dramatically decrease the burden that AFib places on you or on your heart. What are the numbers that they vary widely? Um, the person who developed it claimed a 70% rate, probably 30 to 50% rate of significant reduction in AFib is a reason ballpark number. But don't quote me on that, but it's variable. If a person has like a pacemaker defibrillator or a device like that, to make your heart run beat right, and why do you get the AFib? Why do you get the AFib? Why do you get AFib when you have that device to make it Yeah, so a defibrillator won't treat AFib. A defibrillator is only there to, to, to treat a um, potentially life-threatening rhythm that can occur in the bottom part of the heart called ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. If you have a defibrillator, you've either suffered a cardiac arrest and survived it, or your heart is squeezing very weakly and you're at risk for that occurring. So that's the defibrillator. For the pacemaker, um, if you have some atrial fast rhythms can be paced out of it, but for the AFib, it's a chaotic rhythm. What the pacemaker does is it detects that you're in AFib, atrial fibrillation. Instead of tracking the atrial fibrillation and try to, trying to give you a ventricular rate to match it that's just too fast, it'll switch. The mode will switch and it'll stop, it'll start ignoring what's going on in the atrium will just pace you at, at its pre-programmed rate. Um, the pacemaker itself only can detect the AFib, it can't fix the AFib. If you have permanent atrial fibrillation and you needed a pacemaker, and I was gonna put a pacemaker in you, I probably wouldn't even put in an atrial lead in you, I would just put a ventricular one in just to support your, your ventricular rate, your main heartbeat and just ignore the atrial altogether. We would control your atrial rate through medications, typically. How can you have a heart attack without having any pain? So, um, great question. Some, everyone's a little bit different. Um, no person is, no two people are identical in, in the way that their heart pain presents. Um, some people have typical heaviness on the chest, elephant sitting on the chest, other people have just neck pain or tooth pain, ear pain I've seen as a representation of their angina, heart pain, or back pain only, or shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting. He had none of, no pain at all. So typically it's just the So typically that's called silent angina, and that's more often described in folks who have um, diabetes, um, diabetes with neuropathy. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, like your feet tingle, or you have diabetic gastronephropathy, things like that. There are a few people that I've seen who have a heart attack, not infrequently, who have an EKG that says that they've had a prior heart attack, have an echo that shows that their heart is not squeezing well. We do a heart cath and we see where the blockages in the artery is, and you ask them and they never, they have no idea when it occurred, they have no idea. That's not infrequent. And when it occurred, we don't know. It's a best guess. So n n not, unfortunately, not everyone <clears throat> feels it. I did got done with the stress test. Yeah. What's that? He just got done with the stress test. You had a stress test yeah. and then you had a heart attack? Yeah. Walked walk out. Man. And all he said is he didn't feel right. I didn't feel right. You didn't feel right? Yeah. No. So you were having some symptom, but you didn't feel right. No. Sometimes that not feeling right is the angina. A stress test isn't 100%. A stress test is only there to detect blockages that are significant. If you had like a 30% blockage, 
the stress test isn't going to pick that up. It's not 100%. And then that plaque, that 30% plaque ruptures, and that 30% now became 90% or 100%. It went from 30 to 100 in an afternoon, in an hour, in less than an hour. Yeah, that's, that's a problem, and that's, that's a shortcoming in the practice of cardiology. So to look into that, we are examining through various means, catheter-based means. OCT is one of the catheters. It's an optical, optical way of imaging the coronary artery that would be something really neat to have, as well as different types of intravascular ultrasound to try to determine what's called a vulnerable plaque. And that is a plaque that's there, that's silent, that's not obstructive, but it has a really thin little layer. And we know that that thin layer is at risk for rupture. So what can cause that rupture to occur? Exercise. Exercise can do it, sometimes just because high blood pressure. So unfortunately, what happened to you is not that unusual, unfortunately. It does happen from time to time, not unusual. Any other questions? Yes? You said the burning in the legs when walking. What if you get it when you're sitting? So when typically what that is what's called intermittent claudication, which is poor blood flow into the legs, which usually is exertional in nature. So typically it would be when you walk, you feel it, you stop, it goes away. That's what's typical for blood poor blood flow into the legs. If it's always there, then that the, wide, the range of things that it could be opens up quite a bit. It could be lumbar, back, spinal stenosis. It could be diabetes, nephropathy. Um, it can be medication-induced from things that you've taken. Chemotherapy can do that. Sometimes it can be peripheral vascular disease. If I have anybody that says, you know, I have pain in my calves, it feels like a burning sensation. Well, typically, the, my threshold for what's doing an ABI test, which is a blood pressure test, comparing the legs to the arms as an initial screening test for possible blockages in the legs, my threshold for ordering that test is pretty low. So if you had that complaint with me, I would probably order that test on you. Um, if there's any sort of kind of question in my mind whether what it could be or not. I try as a, one of my philosophies as a physician is not to hang my hat 100% on a symptom. It means this, because it's not always 100%. It can be something else. And I'm always trying to reevaluate the situation and find out, was my initial impression right? Do I need to go back to the drawing board here? So it sounds like in that situation, if I then ordered an ABI test on you and it was normal, I'd scratch my head. Mm -hmm. What else could this be? Any other? Yes? What if you get pressure underneath, like, your breastbone, or you have pain? Yeah. Like, well, here all the time. Like, well, yeah. All the time. So that can be coronary pain, or it could be other things, musculoskeletal pain, gallbladder pain, peptic ulcer. Gallbladder pain. What's that? Gallbladder pain. No. Gallbladder's gone. No. It'd be peptic ulcer to pain, esophageal pain, esophagus pain, like esophageal spasm, it's a muscle yeah. spasm of the it'd esophagus. Be more, it'd be more hit, not on the. Not necessarily. Yeah. I have bird pain myself, and it always radiates right up into here. Okay. It's very sharp. I know. And there are times I think, hmm, if I'm not, uh, yeah. who's on call tonight? Who's yeah. Call tonight? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I feel comfortable here. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Are the symptoms different for a woman than a man? Yes, In, across the board. Yes, more atypical, more atypical, more often just shortness of breath, nausea, breaking out, cold sweat. Atypical. Radiation of symptoms to the back, to the neck, are more typical in women. No, they typically, they teach, if you're in medical school, they say you're on your cardiology rotation. Well, if you're going to have radiation of your chest discomfort, it's due to your heart. It's going to go to your left arm. I've seen it in the right arm. I've seen it in the wrists. So there are a lot of things that can be your what's called anginal equivalent. That is pain from the heart. It's not typically 
heaviness on the chest. If it's going to be atypical, it's more often a woman. Not always, but more often. And historically, women have been undertreated for that reason and have done worse because of the physician's unawareness or lack of concern, not intentionally, but disregard of an atypical complaint in terms of being cardiac. Um, so women's heart health initiatives have addressed that through education, patient education, physician education. But yes. Any other questions? Yeah. Is the plaque test something pretty new? The plaque test? PLAC, I think. Saw a reference to it. PLAC. Plaque. Measures something about the elasticity of the vessels and predicts plaque buildup. Is that a calcium scan? Calcium score? It sounded like a blood test from what I read. I don't know. I'll have to look into that. I don't know what that is. Does anybody else know the plaque test? One thing I wanted to mention is there's, we can do CT scanning, looking at coronary calcification as a way of screening a population at risk. So if you have a family history of heart disease or you have a couple of cardiac risk factors, getting a coronary calcium scan is a reasonable thing to do, even if you're asymptomatic. And the reason that might be an important thing to do is to adjust your goals for risk factor modification. So instead of the cholesterol number being here, it should be here. Instead of accepting the blood pressure number here, it should be here. Being sedentary, get active, stop smoking. It's a way of kind of reinforcing the goals for therapy. If the person is sedentary, my practice would be to follow that up with a stress test. Are you really asymptomatic? Um, but yeah, that test, I don't, I don't know of that, that test. I'll have to look into that. Do you know? Of anything. Do you know what it represents at all? <coughs> yeah. That's my test. It was in a, either the art magazine or some Sunday fire day an article about it. I have to look at look into that. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, can you just describe during a heart attack or before a heart attack, does it describe more as ongoing or one that comes and goes? Both. So one that comes and goes can be an impending heart attack or can be kind of like a stuttering heart attack um, that can last for a day or two, a couple days sometimes. Ongoing pain usually means there's a blockage. The blockage needs to be looked at. So typically somebody who's having an, an, an acute heart attack, acute meaning it's critical, needs to be taken care of immediately. It's typically sustained chest pain or pressure. But you can have that as well in somebody who has a stuttering episode of pain. It's there, it goes away. It's there, it goes away. I see that fairly regularly too. And it, you know, if the story's convincing enough, I don't even do a stress test or anything like that. I take the person to the heart lab right away. And usually, having done this for a little while, usually can get a good idea of when, a, when an artery is hanging on by a thread. And you know, it, it opens up and closes, and opens and closes, and opens and closes, causes, you know, closes and causes pain. A lot of times when you come into the emergency room, they'll start medications that then prevent that from occurring. The person will quiet down, in which case, oftentimes you'll spend the night in the hospital and then we'll do the heart catheterization on you in the morning. Um, it all var it varies about the intensity, of whether the symptoms are chronic, ongoing, intermittent. Any other, any other questions? Yes? How, in, in your practice, how common is like uh, intolerance to statin pills? Pretty common. Pretty common. Unfortunately. Your wife's had four different ones you can't take in. Very common. Okay. Um, yes, that's a problem. It's a big problem. So I've done certain things that have worked. I've changed. I'll try several different statins. Statins are so helpful that I try everything that I can to see if somebody can tolerate them. Um, after I've gone through a series of different ones, sometimes every other day dosing or every third day dosing makes the difference. So there are a few little tricks and things before you just say, oh, well, statins are bad. I can't tolerate them. But it's very common. Some people are just knocked on, on the floor from the, the muscle pain and fatigue. 
and then coenzyme Q10, ubiquinone is the, that's, the problem with coenzyme Q, Q10 is that the preparations are not, uh, preparations that you buy over the counter are expensive, they're not FDA monitored, so the amount of ubiquinone you're getting in them is questionable and variable. And those, that, those compounds have been looked at and studied more than once and haven't unfortunately been shown to make a big difference. Intolerance for those statins. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you.